Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 73. Welcome again. Thank you for being here. Today, I'm speaking with an artist whose work I greatly admire and who has a very unique and beautiful style. I'm speaking with Vitor Velesh. Vitor is a wildlife artist who creates under the name The Headless Sketcher. If you already know his work, you will know how he incorporates writing, line drawing, and incredibly intricate detail into his artwork of all kinds of animal life. If you haven't yet seen these pieces, Follow the links in the show notes, either to the webpage where this episode lives or to Vitor's Instagram page and have a look. During the episode, we speak in detail about all the different elements incorporated into his art pieces and seeing them before listening will make it all the more real. One of the most characteristic elements of Vitor's work is the inclusion of this wonderfully free, continuous line drawing that wanders around the page forming the wire frame of the animal onto which the colour and texture is then layered. During our conversation, we talk all about this process in detail and so much more. Let's listen. Thank you so much for being here with me on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for your patience in waiting for me. Yeah. Not at all. (laughs) So I would love to know about art and nature in your early life. Were you always an artist right from the beginning? Oh, I would say yes. Um, Since I was very, very little, that um, my parents really incentivated me to to paint or to just grab some uh, pencils and uh, uh, my mom used to buy me a lot of these coloring books just with the uh, black shapes and I would buy uh, I would uh, uh, paint them during large large hours and yeah uh, I, I think I learned how to draw by I, I like to sit and copy the covers of my VHSs from Disney or other movies and my mom would would hang them in the kitchen although they were looking back they were not uh, masterpieces but that she would always say um, they were marvelous and I think that really uh, made me confident and enjoy to to paint more and more yeah I, I think when you tell a kid that he's doing something good that really turns him on to just keep mm-hmm. on doing so yeah, I need <laughs> a big thanks needs to go to my parents for always uh, pushing me into uh, something creative or artistic. And when it comes to animals, I, I always had a big fascination about uh, nature and uh, wildlife in special. And my mom usually says that I was uh, predestined to to work with animals as I was born in a hospital in Lisbon, right next door to the zoo. And <laughs> my, my, my mom says that from her, from her, the room where she was laying after I was born, she could see some monkeys uh, playing around the trees in the zoo. So <laughs> that's incredible. And she says that it was my fate to work with animals. And actually, the monkey was my very favorite for a very, very long time. I I always liked monkeys. (laughs) I love that story. (laughs) So you're originally from Portugal, but now you live in Poland. And I'm wondering if you could talk about nature around you. What do you see? What does nature look like where you live? Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that uh, I most fell in love when I came to Poland for the first time. It's how uh, close the nature is around you, because I I was born and raised in Lisbon Mm -hmm. and later lived in Porto, so the two uh, biggest cities in Portugal, so a very urban life. And when I came here to Poland, I live in Poznan, which is still one of the biggest cities in the West, 
but the forest is always max 10 minutes away from you. And here in our house, we basically have the forest right at the end of the street. And in the backyard, we just have a, a small pond that leads to a lake. And so we are really surrounded by nature. And I believe that was also when my heart started to leave buildings and start uh, and entering into wildlife in a more serious way. And I cannot dissociate both things because having nature around me so often and uh, so strongly also made me want to produce more and look at it with more attention and dive in into details and spend time looking at uh, pine cones or leaves or um, some small branches that I would see in the forest. And yeah, I think it was very, very important for um, who I am for the past two, three years to to feel the nature so so close to me. That's so interesting because I was going back through your Instagram feed and I was looking at your yeah. early work and and there was this point. So your beginnings were in architecture and um, all these beautiful buildings and then doo -doo -doo -doo, there's this point where it starts to become yes. <laughs> and nature and, and animals yeah. especially. <laughs> I, 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 I left buildings and I never looked back <laughs> to it because actually... <laughs> Uh, actually, my studies are in architecture, so I made uh, okay. a master's degree in Portugal in architecture, but already on my last year, so the fifth one, I I already knew it, that was not for me and that I wanted something else. Yeah. Later, I still tried for one year and a half to work in some uh, studios, but um, it was interesting, but it didn't satisfy me and I looked mm -hmm. for something else. And that's when uh, wildlife illustration started to pop up. And um, I, I always kept on drawing animals even during studies or in high school, but not as uh, the way I look at it now in uh, fully immersed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been looking at your work in preparation for this interview and and I was reflecting on why your work is so striking to look at. And I think it's because you have this mix of freedom with this expressive line, continuous line drawing, and that's sort of juxtaposed with real precision. You've got this element of wild freedom and then you've got details that are sometimes so precise that you're painting every shadow on every feather of a bird or mm -hmm. the skin of an elephant. And I think it's this combination of looseness and precise detail that gives it so much interest and why it's so striking. Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much for those words. Um, yeah, I think the, the key word that you used is uh, freedom mm -hmm. because um, what struck me so uh, to fall in love so much with uh, animal illustration is the freedom that it gives me in comparison, for example, to draw a building again, because I I really enjoyed also to draw uh, architecture and perspective drawing, um, but there is always a tension be behind you about keeping the perspective, keeping the lines uh, parallel, or the vanishing point needs to be correct, or the all composition will look weird. And when you draw animals, is such a freedom and you, you just lose yourself looking at the details, not worrying about um, what uh, the overall composition or how is it going to look. And there's also one very uh, important point why I like so much nature journaling. And I, even though I'm not so active in the, our Facebook group, I really love to scroll down and look at other people's works because there is so much freedom, so much uh, instant passion and uh, expressionism in each drawing because so, um, we are not worried about um, how is it going to look or is the animal really in these uh, proportions or is um, the body in the the, sh the sh body shape is it correct so 
Uh, I really like this informality that uh, nature journaling and especially drawing animals and nature brings to you because you are drawing um, a fox or an elephant, but no one is going to check on you if this <laughs> animal or this fox exactly looks like the one you are looking at. <laughs> and that's very important for me and for what I do because I tend to, every time I encounter a problem or something I'm not enjoying so much in my work, I always try to f go around the other way and find a route that uh, gives me pleasure and takes me away from this problem. And for example, you mentioned the one line drawing and this loose line that walks around the drawing. And <laughs> that may be a contradiction to uh, what I do because I, I I feel I'm always balancing in a rope line between what it's expressionism and what it's uh, realism. Mm -hmm. I like to hang around between both. And this loose uh, pen drawing line is the one that always pushed me a bit to the expressionism because it's the one I start with. And it's very loose, very relaxed, and I'm not... Uh, worried about how is it going to to look and it places the wire frame for me to to later apply the watercolor or coloring pencil uh, layers on top it's so interesting you said that because when i was looking back at your architectural drawings i noticed that you were you already had this style with the continuous line drawing underneath but the lines were very straight and it was interesting to see that you had straight lines in the buildings and then when you come to your animal mm -hmm. drawings they're flowing and they're turning and twisting and I found that an interesting mm -hmm. um, difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's very true. Uh, but if, if I look back at my first uh, animal sketches, or the ones I was doing at the same time I was still maybe in studies or still uh, very into architecture drawing, there was still a bit of uh, stiffness and uh, mm -hmm. straight lines inside the animals. And with time, I look back and I see that um, the line naturally started to lose itself and go into more curved shapes. And the more I learn and the more I practice about it, the more... Uh, flawless it feels to me and more mm -hmm. uh, curved it becomes yeah. and right now uh, if I look back maybe two three years ago sometimes I would try the same animal maybe two three times to to achieve a, a line I was more pleased with and now it usually comes at the first attempt or maybe uh, second max yeah if I just change some lines because the more you you look at the subject or you focus your your attention in in the animal world, the more you your eyes get sensible to capture um, some general shapes of uh, muscles or body uh, jun junctions of the parts. And I one thing I really like as well in this pen work is that it's not uh, is not very uh, strict about what you are trying to represent. It's just a general wireframe, a scaffolding mm -hmm. for you to to follow later. And sometimes, in some animals, it depends. Uh, it might be important for me to capture a shadow area through this line, or sometimes more of a a muscle tension that is uh, important for me to later. Um, understand where I'm around in the painting or where is the relation about this point in relation to the head or the tail. So this line work is very, very versatile. Yeah, mm -hmm. You can do a, basically everything with it. And uh, going back to what I was saying, it's a bit of a contradiction because sometimes this line work also uh, puts me problems because sometimes it's placed, imagine, uh, because it's a black line and sometimes it's passing on a, on a bright area, for example, I'm thinking of the neck of a fox, which is mainly uh, white and gray. And mm. if the line is crossing, there is going to cause me some problems in the in the upcoming stages of the painting to try to bring up the fur texture to the 
to its uh, three dimensionality or to the front. But at the same time, I don't like to leave this line uh, away from me because it's what gives me what takes me responsibility away from representing a naturalistic uh, animal and it brings me uh, a great fun and i think it i always like to think that fun is very very important for what i'm doing and that's how i try to go around and achieve a solution that it's uh, more pleasant to work with um the same thing for example um, with watercolor and coloring pencils because when i started uh, i only started to use watercolor when i when i started to take animal illustration more serious until there i was quite afraid of watercolor um it's a very fluid medium as everyone probably knows <laughs> and I was always uh, leaving it aside and preferring just pencil charcoal or pens and with animals it naturally brought me the watercolor um, to work with um, but at a certain point I was not satisfied with what I could achieve in terms of details and that led me to look for other solutions and it's where i gradually also uh, came to implement uh, watercoloring pencils and also just normal pencils because um, i like to have uh, various me mediums where i can bring and uh, give me uh, more tools to to achieve uh, a work and for example i like to start a piece with uh, some coloring pencils, just establishing some general shapes or general transitions between colors uh, in a bit of a preparation drawing um, style. And then I I start with bringing watercolor to push the tones up and uh, increase the, um, the contrast. And then it comes again, uh, coloring pencils to build up textures or um, giving the impression of fur skin uh, shiny a shiny coating yeah wow <laughs> it's so so interesting to hear and see especially on your instagram i was looking at your process some of your process mm -hmm. videos and it's amazing to see that about this layer and then this layer and all the different elements that build up bit by bit it's it's amazing one of the one of the big elements that are characteristic of your work that sort of make a piece so recognizably you is the writing that you bring into mm -hmm. the composition and and I've heard you talk about the intimacy and the emotional aspects of writing and how writing we bring so much of ourselves through the writing into the artwork and I'd love to hear you talk about that about the intimacy of it and bringing text into your artwork mm -hmm. yes uh writing is such an important uh, piece of my work and i think it also marked a point where i started to develop myself in a higher level because as well as the line work it helped me lose the fear of the final result and uh, focus more in the on the process and on the discovery inside the page and writing is very very important uh, to me because of that and I, as you said it really brings a, a piece of yourself to the to the page because writing in one way i feel it's a bit more personal than drawing uh, although everyone has its own aesthetics or um we can mimic uh, the st the style or the way of painting of some other person writing is more personal it's um, mm. very very unique to every one of us and when you put it on the page it's something that you are registering more about what you are thinking in the moment and you're putting a piece of uh, not not only what you are writing but what you are feeling uh, what is your relation with uh, with what's around you at the moment? And when you leave it on the page, especially in nature journaling, where we we some we so many times uh, register uh, data about the weather or the, our impressions about 
some landscape or some uh, forest that is surrounding us that brings such a personal impression to to the work itself and I, f I i think it's very very beautiful because in maybe 10 years 15 years you can look back and yes. if you look at the page you might not uh, think you might not remember what you were feeling at the time where you were uh, what was surrounding or who you were with and if you read what you wrote uh, you're you're probably if you register of course on the page you're going to remember precisely that and you will be able to trigger a chain of memories or um, or uh, of thoughts of what you were actually doing and so i feel this what you put on the page not only the writing but the image itself it's kind of it kind of jumps out of the realm of the page and through uh, the memory space and um, yeah it breaks the barrier of time inside the page to something uh, really outside of it and in terms of uh, aesthetics because this is more of um, of the mental part of what mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what writing brings to the page but then you have the aesthetic part and we could talk all, all day all day about so many benefits that uh, writing can bring to your page such as uh, composition element and linking different um, different details on the page or just uh, the way the way you use writing or the type of pen you're using is going to affect the page in a different way or um, how do you place it if you place it in a uh, neat tidy way or if you are more loose about it is going to to give to a page a totally different understanding um, and I, I can reveal a bit of what what is my um, thinking process behind it and I mainly use writing in the initial phase of the of the painting as a research method and mm. and um, a way also of triggering new discoveries and new experimentation because if writing also helps me try to understand what's what is this animal about or sometimes how is how is this part of the body uh, made or what's it what is it it's its shape or sometimes I note something about oh this this animal has a weird proportion because this head feels like doesn't belong to the body. And mm -hmm. it, by writing, I feel that um, it really helps my brain and my head um, wrapping up around what I'm uh, looking at. That's so interesting. And in terms of aesthetics, your handwriting itself looks like something from history. It It, <laughs> it reminds me of something from an explorer's journal or from, mm -hmm. you know, monks, um, the monks who used to be mm -hmm. in monasteries transcribing scripts. I don't know if you, if this is your natural handwriting or if you um, developed this decorative style mm -hmm. for your artwork, but it's very beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, it, it is my natural handwriting, but I can confess beforehand that if I look back, I don't really can read 100% of it but that has to do with the fact that I'm out of school already for some years and no one helped ever after forced me to write anything on paper that I, can, I have to write again apart from a signature on an important paper that I can <laughs> read so again also writing to me it's about what I'm discovering and uh, thinking at the moment. And it's not something that I go back and try to revisit. As, as I say, I really like to do that in other person's work, but I know mm -hmm. it's a bit of uh, irony and hypocrisy of myself, but <laughs> I don't like to do it on my work. So I don't go back and revisit what I wrote. Yeah. And I think that there's something really um, that adds to the romance of it, I think, because mm -hmm. it does look like something from an explorer's notebook. And I think that um, oftentimes I've looked at those 
old um those old manuscripts or whatever it is and and you have to sort of decipher and you can only pick out one or two words and it feels like mm-hmm. that because it's um because it's a little bit difficult to read it's it adds to the mystery of it because you know that it's there but it's it's also a little bit hidden yes yes uh, in the in the second hand i'm also aware of the visual impact of uh, the writing and the way i write so i also sometimes tend to emphasize the curvature of one yeah. line or so i'm also aware that it it's a very important and appealing part of my uh, work so i also use it to my advantage <laughs> and also i think it had an extra layer of uh complicacy the fact that I don't live in my home country so sometimes I tend to write some parts in Portuguese but some parts in English as it, it, mm-hmm. as it is the main source of the bibliography that I'm uh, consulting to learn about the animal so um, you I confess you might also find inside my work on the same paragraph or, or one sentence after the <laughs> other, two different languages, which will make it even more complicated. But <laughs> I, I would say maybe around 80% what I write is in English as it is the, the language in what I'm reading. Yeah, mm-hmm. but occasionally Portuguese uh, expressions or words will pop up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a person with a very, um specific set of history and language um, mm-hmm. in their background that could actually re- follow the entirety of yes one of yes mm-hmm. <laughs> and and i guess that when i become fluent in polish uh, language it might turn up a third language in there to mess <laughs> up things <laughs> i'm wondering about this beautiful um continuous line mm-hmm. drawing so uh, i've seen in your process videos that you have you start with the pencil the base and then you add the, the writing over and then you add the continuous line over the top of that in in a very fluid way and i'm wondering when you're moving that beautiful line across the page are you moving by intuition or have you planned it like you know sometimes you cross the animal in a very bold way mm-hmm. and I'm wondering if that's intuition it's uh, a bigger part intuition yeah I, mm-hmm. I don't usually plan uh, what I do sometimes is that I do the first attempt 100% through intuition and if I'm not satisfied then I do a second time already knowing which are the sensitive points of an animal mm-hmm. and where I for example need to follow a line instead of breaking it so that I don't lose the idea of a leg or maybe a shoulder blade which usually is a bit um, predominant in a lot of mammals that type of things yeah but uh, mainly it's into intuitive Mm -hmm. and the fact that sometimes uh, that I cross the animal so many times is you can see how confident I am in terms of one animal or if it's maybe the first time I doing it the number of times that I cross it and I I really like to look back and you can see where are my hesitations and where I'm confident Mm -hmm. I really like that that's so interesting do you have a favorite step in the process as you're building Mm -hmm. up the painting I really really I like the final product of course (laughs) but I really like the point where there is only pen along all the page and where there is already the animal and the writing and where the boundaries between both are faded and Mm. I like to look at it because you might not understand that the animal is there in some parts especially for example in details that are more abstract the line and I really like to look back and then compare to the final product and see how I made it pop up from the from the line drawing and from the writing around um not losing the notion where where it is yeah Mm -hmm. i would say that is my favorite part i love that about your work too that all the elements are blending the line the watercolor overlaying the the script it's all very blended and i think that's Mm -hmm. unique and beautiful to your style yeah thank you so much Uh, i really like to take away pressure from 
what it's the final product. And I feel that mm -hmm. nature journaling and looking at other people's work really helps me uh, keep on thinking like that. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's very important that we don't over respect what the paper is or what we are putting on the paper and don't be afraid of uh, risking or or laying down some media that we are not so confident with because in the last case the worst that can happen to you is that you need to tear down a new page and start again <laughs> and i know that in today's social media world and um, the world of sharing beautiful things we look at the artist and i'm going to speak for myself you can look at my work and you might not uh, realize how many attempts I failed or uh, <laughs> how many how many pages behind this beautiful yes. drawing are the ones that didn't uh, go well and um, I remember for example the the painting I've made of an octopus it took me maybe one week to go through halfway of it and to realize that it was ruined and that I could do nothing about it and I had to start again and yeah so uh, to not over respect mm -hmm. yeah I think it's important for uh, for us as viewers of incredible images all over the internet that yeah to remember mm -hmm. that that everyone is the final... fails <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> exactly I'm interested because you paint species of all kinds and you haven't necessarily seen these animals in real life and and yet there's a relationship that builds there I'm sure and I'd love to hear more about developing a relationship with the animal that mm -hmm. you learn because you do a lot of background research you learn all about their intricacies and all their different special habits and stuff like that does it help you fall in love a little bit with each of the animals that you're painting oh yes definitely <laughs> I sometimes I receive the commission about an animal that I don't know anything about just the name or maybe I've seen it coming across some documentary and I know nothing about it and mm -hmm. it really excites me to go and research and know uh, fall in love with it really uh, because so far in all the animals I've painted there there wasn't a single one that I didn't paint and I didn't fall in love with and mm. I probably said a thousand times oh I am a big I'm a confessed lover of this animal because I've painted it and that's, that's <laughs> yeah. just the truth. Um, because the way I work, I, I really like, as you said, to do a very thoughtful uh, research about uh, a species. And for example, before I start um, making a painting, I, I have one, two months, sometimes more behind it that I already know I'm going to paint it and I start, mm -hmm. um, I collect multiple images, videos, and I, I watch documentaries. And for example, a very important aspect to me as well is sound. Um, mm -hmm. it, might be, it might be not so uh, plain to see on a painting as it's a mute um, piece of art, but I like to watch, for example, documentaries but without the video and I, I'm just working on something else and I have the, the sound plugged on my earphones and I'm listening to how does this animal sound if I'm not seeing it. And for example, that I remember that was very important for me for the uh, an orca piece I've made because I was listening to them and I was just fascinated by their vocalizations and how, they, how complex is the their communication. And that, for example, made me want to paint the orca with the mouth open and not closed mm. because I wanted to evoke that experience of me uh, uh, falling in love with their complex vocalizations. And I wanted that to be um, included in the painting. And yeah, I really fall in love with all the animals <laughs> I, I paint because I spent two, three, four months with them and um, also another aspect is that I really don't like to rush on on mm. painting. I don't I, mm -hmm. I don't accept works with the timeline or with the deadline because 
sometimes you need to spend a week with it. Sometimes you need to spend two months until a, a work is done. And I really believe you cannot rush the art piece to come out of the paper. Mm -hmm. I love that. And sometimes you work on multiple different pieces at the same time. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Basically, always. I'm, I have three, okay. four different pieces on, <laughs> on the studio. Yeah. Uh, I can confess it creates a bit of mess, of course, <laughs> because, <laughs> but I believe that's a syndrome that. Uh, it's common to every artist. Yes, if I could show you my desk right now. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I believe, I believe I have the syndrome of never enough space. I can have all the house for myself, and still I would think, oh, I would need yes. one more table because this doesn't <laughs> fit. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, I I really like to have around three four pieces at the same time because it allows me to work intense but short periods on them. So, for example, I work one morning in one piece and then even though I'm really enjoying and I really want to continue, I jump to another one because I know mm -hmm. that will keep me hungry and uh, motivated to, on the next day, come back to it with the same type of energy. In contrary, for example, to paint 12 hours the same day on the same painting, which would make me tired and for sure not as highly productive on it and on the day after maybe i would be mm, i'm a bit tired of this painting maybe i don't want to finish mm -hmm. it so i always keep myself motivated by switching between painting 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 and then i also like to finish them at the same time For if i'm working on four then even though one only needs maybe half a day of work to finalize it, I leave it waiting for the others to complete, to close a cycle, as I like to uh, think of them as a group and as a series of paintings. So I've worked intensely on this group and I'm finishing them. I'm saying bye, I'm sending them to the, to the clients and I'm starting a new group and the new group comes together um, comes alive together at the same time that's a really interesting idea that you stop before you get mm -hmm. ready to stop and that, that keeps you motivated I love that because I have felt that myself where you're grinding away on something trying to finish it and it just does not maintain the level of joy that you'd hope would yes, be there yes. mm -hmm. that also it's from from the process and um, productivity point of view it also allows you to for example choose from the three or four different works that you have at the same time which one you are in more in the mood or what suits mm -hmm. you more at the time for example i already know myself and i know to not start some to not work on something demanding or complicated in the evening or mm -hmm. late afternoon because if I don't achieve a satisfying uh, point before going to bed, I'm going to bed in a bad mood. <laughs> and I'm going to, my the back of my head will be thinking about yes. it when going to bed and I'm not going to, to be satisfied for the morning. So I tend to, yeah. for example, evenings or late afternoons to work on a, p a part of the piece of these three or four I can choose from that it's more mechanical and I need to wow. exercise my brain less. Yeah, that that's makes just so much uh, sense. Yeah, that's just the way <laughs> I, I kind of start to find myself uh, more suitable to. Mm -mm. So there's this, um, there's an important element in your pieces that you can't see with your eyes, but it's always there. And that is that you are telling a story and you have the intention to tell a story. And I'd love to hear mm -hmm. your words on that about coming to a piece and having a story play out, you know, the, the way the moment comes together where those elements are on the page, but it's, it's telling something about the animal. Yes, yes. Um, storytelling and the construction of a narrative inside a painting is very, very, very important for me. And it's maybe what fascinates me more when looking at uh, other artworks or, for example, mm -hmm. I'm... I have a big love for art history and mm -hmm. uh, to look at 
mainly about painting. I like sculpture and uh, other art forms as well, but painting is my main uh, crush in terms of art history. <laughs> and I really like to look at a painting, for example, and go and research deeper and find what's the story behind it. Because mm -hmm. again, but if you don't have writing and if you don't have a description, you might look at a work and you don't re realize what the artist is trying to say. And sometimes it's just fascinating to know the background or the uh, the history of what came to become this painting. And that's also very important to me. And such a, the deep research I do is in order to understand and come to a point of discovering what's the story I want to tell about this animal. I mm. So I don't like to receive a commission and jump straight into it um, knowing, okay, I just need to represent this animal and I'm going to do this. I want to know what I want to tell about this animal. And sometimes uh, the person to whom I'm painting uh, this work asks me already for a narrative or uh, some mm -hmm. special moment or story behind it. And sometimes I have to find it and then discuss it with the person and uh, come to a common ground. And that also reveals a bit of my other influences behind painting, because I, I really like cinema and the way, the art of telling a story inside a frame or inside a a short clip and I think you when I look at my paintings I really see this influence of cinema also coming into the way I like to arrange the different uh, the different elements of the page or how do they communicate and for example uh, when I'm drawing a full body animal I usually build it out of multiple um, reference images so I might be I might be looking at one picture where I like just the the way the head is turning, but then I don't like the legs. So I'm going mm -hmm. to look for some legs where I can include or I, the tail. I like um, I can bring the tail from another video that uh, I've collected, so that the it really fulfills the the narrative that I'm trying to pass for the for the page. And for example, the point of view as well. Uh, if I'm trying to give the impression that the the animal is more more vulnerable or uh, it's shy, elusive, I tend to draw it maybe from a, a more elevated point of view, or I I make it look outside of the page or inside of the page, and also for example the amount of uh, empty space I leave to the side. Um, that the animal is not looking at is going to have a great effect on how does it feel to the observer. And that's things that you can learn from cinema and how directors compose a, a shot or how do they um, how do they position the actors inside a, a specific frame or what's the frame ratio. Um, yeah, yeah, I could also <laughs> spend a lot of time talking about how how cinema uh, t t teaches me so much uh, yeah. for my painting. I, I was so interested to, in your class that you gave to the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference. I loved the moment where you had the two animals looking inward at each other and it was mm -hmm. a very unified composition. And then you just said, hey, but what happens if they're looking the opposite way outside of the page away from each other and it just completely changed mm -hmm. the feeling and the the whole story of what was happening there on that page i thought that was a really powerful demonstration oh thank you yeah exactly that's just to what i was saying about where the animal the animals or it can apply to any subject you're painting that has a face let's say where are mm -hmm. they looking at is so important to what you're trying to transmit with the um, with the with the painting if they are looking to the left but if that the left is empty and a big space uh, they are going to look intrigued and looking for something there but if they are looking to the right where there is empty space or where there is the end of the page then you the observer will will start thinking where are they looking at what's 
outside mm -hmm. the page and for example now i'm we are talking about it and i'm thinking that um I've learned that with the movie Pulp Fiction, for example, mm -hmm. where there is this very famous scene where they are um, where they are going to dance, and before they are sitting uh, front of uh, in front of each other, and there is a very awkward silence until the the character of John Travolta say, or maybe it's Uma Turner, I don't remember, but one of them says, "Hmm, what an awkward silence." And <laughs> If you stop the screen at that very moment, you are going to look. You are going to realize that both of them are are sitting in opposite sides of the frame, so they are mm -hmm. complementary to each other. And both of them are looking outside of the page, but with a very empty space inside the frame on the opposite side. So mm -hmm. that's a common way of transmitting um, uncomfortable situations. And you can use you can use that. Uh, to a painting, for example. So mm -hmm. I use this type of um, tricks. We can call it tricks because they, they are... Um, yeah, yeah, it's useful to think about that. There's another thing that you use really beautifully and that is the idea of movement. And so mm -hmm. there's a real attention to the subtlety in the body posture of your animals or the way a head is tilted or a paw is lifted just off the ground. And mm -hmm. I think that... That helps telling the story because I uh, one example I'm thinking of is the fox. You have one beautiful one of the fox where it's mm -hmm. poised and it's it's got its head just so and and the story of what is it what is it listening to and then and then another element of that composition is that the fox is darting away and mm -hmm. yeah I'm interested in that idea of dynamic movement and and how that tells the story as well. Yes. Yes. Um... I really like movement inside the painting and that always uh, pushes me back to Baroque art, which um, uh, I, I really appreciate. And that I, I, I very common have that into account that uh, I really like to capture a moment right after or right before something is about to happen because that brings such a big tension to to the actual re representation. Uh, because if you show a movement, a full movement, uh, the action that you are representing is going to finish there, what uh, inside what you are showing. But if you, sh if you rather represent the moment before or after, you're going to make the observer think about mm -hmm. how does it, how did it start or how does it finish? And mm -hmm. that's, for example, why I like to use small tilts of the head or, for example, uh, in the case of the fox that you were mentioning, why just one paw is touching the ground? Mm -hmm. Because if you think, again, as the painting as one frame, I'm capturing the frame where the one paw is already touching the ground, but the other two or three are still in the hair. So that for the observer is going to because your brain really is really really good in associating uh, uh, things that he already knows or uh, into filling up gaps of information mm -hmm. so you are looking at one frame but your brain is going to complete the two frames after the two frames before so you are going to think of the fox before that moment and after that moment, after pouncing again and uh, starting the next uh, step or run. And for example, I also really like to create a bit more tension by unbalancing axis. And always, I always try to uh, create a position where the animal is not fully parallel to the page because that's going to create some area of discomfort for the eyes to to rest be, uh, on the relation be, be, between the the limits of the page and the the animal body yeah it reminds me again of cinema because the mm -hmm. best quality cinema is it doesn't tell you every piece of the story yes, explicitly yes. Mm -hmm. it just it gives always, a subtle mm -hmm. it always keep it always keeps you on the edge that you are yes. wondering oh what's going to happen or why is this like yes, or, or just a hint of, a hint at something and then your mind fills in the rest and mm -hmm. that's when the power comes, I think. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's also why it's so important for me to make a, a thorough research before so that I understand how the animal moves and uh, mm -hmm. what's the exactly point where I want to to capture it so that it gives the impression of the the way it moves or jumps. Um, for example, with again with this example of the red fox, I was wondering for a long time if to if to represent it running or uh, pouncing, so to hunt in the snow, uh, trying to catch a mouse. And I went with um, with the running uh, option because I felt it was more interesting from the point of view of showing all the body and all the tension that the muscles are in when uh, um, jumping off the ground. Mm -hmm. So there's this lovely story behind the reason why you make art under the name The Headless Sketcher. And I wonder if mm -hmm. you could um, tell that little story. No, yes, of course, of course. Um, yeah, it's it's no secret about it. Uh, it's just, <laughs> um, it has to do some, with something that uh, one teacher of mine that I had in high consideration once told me when I was rather young, so it was in high school. and. At the time, I was my drawing was very very rigid and very uh, held to realism, and um, and he told me that on the day that I started using my head less and my arms more, my drawing would take to one a completely new level, and that stayed with me, and it made me think, hmm maybe someone even without a head could also be able to draw <laughs> if he just leaves gives the hand freedom without using the the head and but in other hand that's also again a contradiction because i feel that my 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 work is very uh, mental and I, I i'm very always very conscious of all the choices i make or the composition i i change um, so the name I use is also uh, a constant reminding, a reminder of what I, who I want to become in the future mm -hmm. and a reminder that, okay, maybe here you should, again, use your head less and your hands more. Trust in the improvisation and in the unpredictable. And perhaps when I'm 80 years old or 90 years old, I will be able to do it. I don't know. Maybe then... <laughs> I will change my name and to the, <laughs> yeah, I will finally achieve my motto. <laughs> I love this story because I, I just love that idea that it helps you free that mm -hmm. arm and it helps you get, get more into the intuition of it or, or the free, the freedom of it. But I also love the story because things we say influence people and I wonder mm -hmm. if this teacher even remembers saying that but just one thing that you that he said to you has has come with you and it's 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 developed you and it's helped you develop your own style and technique and I, I think it's important that we always remember that the things we say to others can have an impact and this teacher had such a lasting impact on you I, Oh. Yes, exactly. And I, I feel that when once we are younger and especially at the age of development, we are so much susceptible to uh, drain, uh, to absorb what something important that, that stays with us for all the life. And sadly, this teacher of mine passed away uh, very mm -hmm. shortly after I was a student of him. And this sentence that he, he gave me didn't uh, sink in immediately and maybe I just thought about it uh, some years later and I never had the chance to tell him how important mm. that was for me but um, in other hand also I think that this doesn't matter because for sure at the moment he saw my eyes blinking and, and realizing oh this makes sense that mm -hmm. I, I might do with some advice like that mm -mm. wow <laughs> so you've mentioned a few times that you make artwork um, sometimes by commission and I'm so interested in this process because 
when you make a commission for someone, you're often taking a memory of theirs and you're putting it through your own brain, through your own hand, into mm -hmm. your own style. But your idea is to make something that's meaningful, that captures their own memory. And I love, I'd love to hear you speak about this process. How does someone transmit their memory and their desire for what they want in a piece to you and then you translate that into something real that they can hold and treasure forever mm -hmm. uh, yes i really I, i'm not the type of artist that it's very uh, that has his own work in very high consideration in terms of no one can tell me what i want to do i'm the artist mm -hmm. so i know what i'm going to put on the page and i really <laughs> like there is always there is always clients that sometimes just give me complete freedom and want me to surprise them and of course i accept that and it's also a great way of uh, challenging myself or trying something new for example but my favorite commissions always are the ones that come with the be a story behind of some moment that the person wants to treasure and um i i always try to to include for example reference pictures that the person uh, mm. provides me with and even though I'm going to uh, draw the animal in a completely different pose or point of view uh, I always try for example to on the facial features to capture the ones of the animal uh, from the picture I was provided with um, mm. or some I always it's also one thing that really fascinates me is how can in different species, you can identify different individuals inside. Um, uh, which characteristics make them unique? For example, the spots or the markings or the pattern uh, under mm. belly in, in case of aquatic animals. And I also try to bring that bring those details to the painting so that the person later when sees that uh, work hanging in their house can remember oh this was exactly this animal i saw in this uh, experience i had or this mm. adventure such an important moment i like to capture that oh wow there's a, there's one that i loved that you did which was a um a humpback whale mm -hmm. and it was significant because the person had um had this moment with the whale and had looked the whale into the in in the eye and that was really significant and so you took you did the whale in its entirety and then you did a, a detail of the whale's eye and I thought that was beautiful to a, a beautiful significant way to translate her experience yes that was a very very uh, interesting commission because that person was swimming with whales in the island of Tonga and provided mm. me with some very, very interesting uh, footage of the sw swim and also some pictures of that exactly whale. And she wanted me to capture, she wanted to remember this experience forever as it was in her words, the most incredible um, moment of my life. And I, she swam with the mom whale and its young calf. And oh, wow. she wanted to capture this whale forever in paper. And she told me one of the moments, one of the most interesting moments of this experience was to look when her and the whale's high uh, connected. Mm -hmm. And she told me it was so impressive because the whale is such a big animal that you can only see one eye at a time and oh. it's something you don't think about before uh, actually experience it and that it's also very very important to me because of the fact a lot of times i don't have the chance of seeing the animals alive uh, at the moment or um, mm -hmm. to to have a personal experience from the past where i already know the animal and that also helps me a lot to transmit the actual essence of the animal to the page. And for example, on that one um, um, back whale piece, some of the text I also included in the painting are some personal memories of that person. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. And actually, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering now, we were talking earlier about uh, the writing and the fact that I cannot always read what I write, what I wrote. And I also had one time one commission where the person asked me to hide 
a birthday wishes inside the painting uh, oh, wow. <laughs> at one moment of the writing and <laughs> because that commission was meant as a per as a birthday gift, a gift. And, that, mm -hmm. and the person who received it only realized there were birthday wishes quite a lot of time uh, later on oh. <laughs> after receiving <laughs> it. <so> cool. <laughs> I love that. Another example of this um, beautiful attention to the mm -hmm. person's vision that you had was one, another one to do with whales, where you did you designed for a friend a whale tattoo. And it was based mm -hmm. on their experience seeing whales in La Réunion. Yes, and, yes. And I just love that you did, the, because when we're whale watching, we we see often the tail in great detail and the body maybe just a glimpse. And so you did this beautiful minimalistic line drawing of a whale and then full detail in the tail. And I thought mm -hmm. that was really, really special way to depict his the, your friend's experience of of whale watching. Yeah, the, that one was quite easy because he's one of my best friends, so we talk quite often and I knew he was there and we exchanged a lot of pictures and talked. So I knew exact, even though I was not there, I quite knew exactly what mm -hmm. his experience was about. So it was easier to to find an idea about how to, to make this this piece. Yeah, and I really, really liked it because it was also an... A very good excuse to ex to experiment and discover with the um, dialogue between this realistic pen drawing and at the same time this uh, more expressionist uh, mm. one line uh, wireframe. Yeah. I love this style, this element of your style, which is that sometimes you have great detail in one section and then just leave the frame, like you said, the wireframe untouched in the other section and it really brings something it brings a real uniqueness to the piece and I love mm -hmm. that how it's it's there's this contrast yes um what one other aspect I really like is to uh, bring up the attention and enhance all the techniques and sta stages that are inside the piece so I like to Every time that's possible, I like to leave some section unpainted so that the mm. wireframe still pops up and you are able to see the process or the different mm. layers that compose the image. And because that's what I like also to see in other uh, person's art is I like to see and, and realize the brush strokes or how did this person do in terms of physical uh, the physical aspect of the, the painting. And I like to think of it as, for example, I'm I'm holding the animal, the wire, the pen drawing with my hand, and I'm dipping it into a bucket of watercolor oh, and I and, love uh, that. and paint. So the part <laughs> of the animal which yes. I'm holding with my hands doesn't get tipped. Uh, yes. dipped, so <laughs> it, it 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 is left unpainted. I yeah. love that imagery. That's really cool. <laughs> So you have been developing your own ability to print, to, to create prints of your artwork at home. Mm -hmm. And this has been a bit of a, a, a deep dive into all the different aspects of printing. Do you feel like you've mastered it now? <laughs> yes, quite so. I think uh, I'm very happy with the results, but it was a, a very big hassle. And I, I can <laughs> say it's not, not easy, especially when technology is against you. <laughs> but um, yeah um, I, I started to do it because I was quite frustrated with the fact I couldn't control the outsourcing of the printing aspect and I wanted mm -hmm. to bring it home and uh, be able to control all the steps of the of the process mm -hmm. and that's very 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 it was a very good step um because it allowed me to eliminate the third factor and it's only me, the computer and the printer. So I'm able to also experiment more because if something went wrong, I can just uh, experiment and print again in different settings and stuff. But once you figure out the exact settings and the calibration of the printer, your laptop, it's it gets uh, quite easier, yeah. One of the most difficult parts of the 
of the whole process is actually the scanning because of the mm -hmm. texture of the paper. I use a uh, hot pressed paper, so it has less texture, but still, uh, especially in the writing, the pen always fades a tiny bit when it, yes. uh, because of the paper surface. So when it scans and we are trying to remove the background, there's always a bit of writing that it's disappearing. So uh, before I scan a, when I scan a painting and before it's ready to print, sometimes I always have to fix all the letters individually of one wow. painting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and tell me about the future. What are your hopes and goals for the, for your creative expression? Oh, I I would say I'm in a very happy moment, and mm -hmm. I the first goal, of course, is to maintain and to mm -hmm. stay where I am in terms of fulfillment and uh, happiness doing what I do. And um, I just hope I will have the chance to to perhaps uh, travel and uh, collect some more experience, wildlife mm -hmm. moments, so that I can also translate that into, into the paintings I do. I, I feel mm -hmm. that... Uh, even though all the research I do and all the um, process behind, there is always some gaps that you cannot fill until you experience mm. uh, these wildlife moments. Yeah, and I have some quite, quite some ideas and projects I would like to do in the future. Perhaps work with some uh, wildlife organizations or. Uh, entities that protect uh, wildlife and yes. to help raise sensibility to uh, the disappearing of so many species and uh, wildlife uh, re the wildlife richness of our world yes but uh, i'm very very happy doing what i do so yeah i i wouldn't complain at all <laughs> it's been so nice to talk to you oh, thank, thank you, you so very, much Pithen. very much for being here <laughs> It was the biggest pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm a common listener of your podcast and it's a big honor to be part of it, really. Oh, it makes me so happy. Thank you again. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Vitor. I really enjoyed hearing him speak about the different ways of keeping the joy and the fun alive, like not accepting commissions with a deadline and working on three or four pieces at the same time to be able to skip between them, depending on his mood or the time of day. I think this is absolutely genius. I also really enjoyed hearing Vitor speak about the research phase of his work and how learning about each of the animals helps him fall in love with nature again and again. If you're on Instagram, please do follow the Headless Sketcher there, and if you appreciate his artwork, why not send Vitor a message to let him know? It can be really motivating to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. <music>